Shall we make a star, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Welcome to the January meeting yeah. of Pontoary History Society, and a happy New Year to you all. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to see you all out. I know it was New Year's Day, but yeah. I'm not surprised. <laughs> They're all the same when you retire, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 And this evening he's going to do his talk on Walt Disney and Great Uncle George. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> mm, well, happy New Year to everybody. It's a great to see so many years. Um, this story is a very personal story. It's a family story, as you'll find out. Um, I started research on it. But I didn't call it research then. There was just some more information about Uncle George. And at the age of 15. And um, over the years, and my cousin Alvin Jones, who has now passed away unfortunately, I brought him bits of information. We exchanged information about him. I'm very <coughs> proud of him, as you'll see later on. And uh, I thought it was about time that I compiled a, his story so that uh, people can hear it and enjoy it. I, I hope you enjoy it. Turn the light out Yes, we turn the light. Um, so, yeah, just a little bit more like so this way. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Just read it. Mm -hmm. Let's have a bit more light on this way. And can we have a bit, not all light, but a bit no, light? No, is he all or nothing, is it? Yeah. Oh, I, I should have gotten a bigger towel there. That's right, we can see it. Yeah. 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 Not so well, though. Anyhow, how did you start? Brian here is about talk. We all have family stories about ancestors. Oh, lovely. Okay, you can turn it out now. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay you read it. It's in a right way. We all have family stories about ancestors who have lost their lost an inheritance, or some who have great expectations, or perhaps received a windfall. And so it was our family. When I was young, my grandmother would receive letters from my great uncle George, her brother, who lived in America. He was a master and stonemason and sculptor. In those days, little was said about the family, but he picked up um, bits of information. We, and we lived in my grandmother's shop in Friuland, on the way in. And six people, my grandmother and grandfather, in the room behind the shop. My, mo my mother, my brother, my mother and father, and my brother and myself in the room behind. And my aunties, I would come to see my, my aunties, and would, and would come to see my grandmother once a month. To catch up on the few on the family news. No, because in those days when when someone emigrated, and the only way you'd have you'd have information is to exchange letters. Mm -hmm. And the letter I would come to my grandmother, my aunties would come, and she'd read up the letter. <coughs> and my aunts would come to see my grandmother once a month to catch up on family news. And the sisters were my Auntie May and Auntie Winnie. 
Auntie Willie was like all the people in those days, I'm seeing our personalities, our funny personalities as your aunties. Auntie Willie, I would only visit on the dark winter evenings. And because and because um, she did not like uh, being seen, I'd uh, uh, be seen visiting what she considered and the rougher parts of the wedding. <laughs> in the light evenings. We would call her a social play the day or not. <laughs> I'm sure your land and packments puzzle had a reputation uh, for being the rougher part of the wedding. And Auntie Winnie lived in the posh part, we indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Auntie May and the other sister was a widow. And if she survived by taking in a lodger, making herself available and for laying out the dead, assisting where mothers were, were and recovering from childbirth and outspinding amongst other things. And they came to our house and my grandmother read her brother George's letter to them. received a letter saying that uh, Walt Disney, the famous uh, film producer who created the character Mickey Mouse and also the cartoon film Snow White, had seen a model, had seen a model he had made and said he was interested in buying it for a, for a future project he had in mind and to contact him should he decide to sell it. My auntie May, his sister said, if he did, and anything happened to with George, he would leave a bit of money. I'm sure he had to lay on the money. <laughs> Uncle George was single. He lived in America and did eventually sell the model of the Capitol building, which is the American House of Parliament, and to Walt Disney for an unknown sum. So I suppose it would raise expectations. He died in 1962 in San Francisco. What about the wind for? They spoke of nothing changed in our lives. I want you to know more about my rich uncle in America. Mm -hmm. There's Walt Disney, there's my uncle there. There's Uncle George. I want you to know about my rich uncle George. And the opportunity came later, when at the age of book 15, my mother said that Uncle George had written an account entitled Places I Have Worked in Canada and the United States. And my auntie May, his sister, had a copy. I went to see her, and then alone to photocopy the three full scrap sheets, those are the full scrap sheets I had, of his travels. Which was fortunate because when I contacted her family many years later, that they had no knowledge of his travels. So this is the story researched by my cousin Elvin Jones and myself. This is the Lloyd family firm, the advert for them. And they live in 39 Dufferin Street, Mountain Ash, which you may find strange. See, I'm talking about Pontu Wainith. I'll explain that in a minute. Lloyd, he was a, a master mason over there, so he was making monuments, uh, uh, monuments, tombs, headstones, or uh, renovations, engraving, wood carving. And he also had his sons working for him, who were, who were um, carpenters and um, 
house decorators so to so recover the old spectra. Now the reason the reason that he was over he was he was over about in Ash was because he married twice. And the reason the family films in Mountain Ash was my great grandfather had married twice. His first wife had died in childbirth. When my grandmother was 15, her mother was on her ninth child. And she called her upstairs, the story is my auntie told me, she called her upstairs and said, Well, I don't think I'll survive this. So if anything happens to me, you'll be the mother of the family. And my, and my grandmother, Mary Elton, was 15 years old. And, uh, and she died. And her father, who, 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 who went to look for work, and he went over up to Mountain Ash, where he went into lodgings. In the lodgings was a, a school teacher there, a Miss Jones. She was 30, 31, and she was 30 years old when they married. So they got together and he married. But he stayed over in Mountain Ash, and he had a house in Cotton Way and my and my grandmother looked after the house in Cotton Way with the family. So he had two rooms for him, he kept them going. And my grandmother and kept some drawings her brother had made while he was apprentice learning the trade. But she always kept at home. We go open them and have a look at them. These are his apprentice drawings. Mm -hmm. And the first is a free hand drawing there. It says free hand. On the bottom it says free hand classes. And the second drawing is obviously uh, I'm using a compass um, to make sure that the, I'm doing accurate circles and things like that. And um, so that he knows when he was making stonework, things would be accurate. And it's not very clear because it was, because it's faded a lot. But those that's a stone a pillar there. So he's been <laughs> drawing the stone pillars and stone blocks and grooves in them. And then he's learning his lettering. He was either working in Cardiff at the time or lodging in Cardiff. Perhaps learned his trade in Cardiff. But he went to Porth Call. Mm -hmm. The seaside wasn't there, obviously. Mm -hmm. But there's a sailing ship and the lighthouse. So uh, as a young boy, he had gone to Porth Call for the day, and there was no. And this was the sight we saw there. And like the young boy's imagination, <coughs> Everybody loves treasure under the sea. <laughs> so there is glory of the divers under the sea, finding treasure and, and fending off the swordfish there. No sharks, just swordfish. And my grandmother kept these like got them at home myself. He worked in the family firm and took him with I should imagine that he was qualified. And then, and then he went to work. He sought work outside Mountain Ash. A new civic centre was being built in Cardiff. Did you ever look at the civic centre? They were starting to build that, so there was plenty of work about. Fancy making a start on that, mm -hmm. starting your career. There was work for everybody and especially if you were um, skilled. He started work there. He worked on the law courts. He worked on the museum. He worked on the university. So uh, there was years and years and years of work there for people. In 1907, at the age of 28, he decided to go to Canada. There's a city hall, he worked on the city hall as well. He decided to go to Canada. 
and he caught and this ship. It's wonderful what you can find on the internet. He, he sailed on this ship over to Canada for the two Nassim. And it must be quite experienced in those days because the I mean, we only used to go to Bali and both go, and he's off to, off to Canada. He was 28, though, to learn his trade. He went up to the Gulf of St. Lawrence there, and, they, and he went to Quebec. He went to Quebec there. He said he landed in Quebec, and he caught a train. He took a train out to Montreal. So he landed in Quebec on the Saturday. He took a train to Montreal and he started work on the Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, now I thought, well, it, it's awful quick to be able to land and to uh, start a job so quickly I had to get on the train. Anyhow, I went on. And we went on a cruise to Quebec and we um, sailed up the Gulf of St. Lawrence there. And then when you landed, in Quebec, there's a hill, there's a big hill in front of you. And you go up, up in the lift up to the top of the hill, and as soon as you get to the top there, there's a huge hotel, which was the station hotel, and that was the station terminal. So you just get off the ship, up the top of the cliff, and you got on the uh, on the train. And off you went up to Montreal. And he started work on, on the McGill University. And the, um, the McGill University was created in 1829. And they were building a new faculty and to study agriculture. And unusual in those days, it was for, both for men and for women. So I think that was a, a real breakthrough in that time. In 1907. Anyhow. He worked at the university until the October and the winter started to set in and uh, the St. Lawrence would have frozen up and he wouldn't have had any work. So, so he returned, he got on a ship and returned back home. And he, uh, and he returned home. He worked in Cardiff and then they sent him to work on extension of the British Museum. So he worked on the British Museum then. And, um, and three years later, in 1910, he decided to return to Canada once more. And he sailed. <coughs> sailed again on the same journey across up the Gulf of St. Lawrence to Quebec. And then and to the McGill University again. And to work on the University again. This page is in the other side. When I looked at the university site on the internet, they were having to replace the copper cladding on the roofs, which had been of there since 1829. And the green copper domes were a hallmark of the college. I remember when I worked in, in Newport in the 1950s, as the train approached the town across the river, the green, the green copper dome of the College of Art would catch your eye, an attractive feature. It always seemed to pull you your gaze. And so it was at the McGill University. And the question was asked, how long would it take after the mellow green and patina to return? And the answer was 30 years. And the copper sheets would first turn brown and after years acid rain would gradually change it to green. It was reported in 1829 and the green patina had returned in five years. And the question was asked, was then asked, how was this achieved? How was this result achieved 
in such a short time? The, uh, the answer was, they speeded up the acidic reaction on the copper sheets using what they had available. And what they had available was Horses. Horses. Um, when they asked how, uh, when they asked how it was possible, they were told the horses were being used to bring material, and had their urine collected in pails, mm -hmm. and the copper sheets were mopped with this acidic solution, which speeded up the process a quicker reaction than we give for acid rain. Unfortunately, this source is no longer available. <laughs> oh, in 1911, a male party from Mountain Ash is I was amazed how many Welsh um, choirs went over there. In 1911, a male voice party from Mountain Ars was a tour in Canada and came to sing in the town. He met them after the performance and said he had a wonderful evening. In, um, in December 1930, he returned home for a short while and returned home again in July 1914. That year, the First war, World War started in Europe. He had two brothers, Archie and Cyril. Archie was already in the army. Then Archie arrived in his <coughs> own box. And, and while he was home, there was recruitment drives going on where, uh, where you'd have the uh, local volunteers would march in front. And, and the band in front of them playing, the big wigs would be in the car. There was a strong wagon then on the side was follow us to the recruit center. So some young men would fall in behind them, go to the recruiting center and sign up to go to um, sign up to go in the army. Well, I mean, Archie was already in the army, and uh, he evidently, Uncle George thought about this, and then when he returned to Canada, he sent the money home for his younger brother, Cyril, to come over to Canada and join him, and avoid conscription, because some of the, they were having a, the white feathers and all that. But Cyril and his younger brother wrote thanking him, but said he did not want to be branded a coward, and he joined the army as a gunner. In 1916, the Canadian Houses of Parliament caught fire, and, and several people were trapped and died in the fire. It had to be completely rebuilt except for the library, which was saved by closing an iron door. So you can see where the building is completely burnt out, except for this bit at the end. This is the library, obviously. And the fire door was closed, and it saved that part of the building. But apart from that, everything had to be completely rebuilt. And obviously, Uncle George saw that uh, they needed um, men there, stonemasons, so, so he travelled to Ottawa to work and to work on the on the Parliament buildings. And then in nineteen seventeen he decided how to move into America. He crossed into America, he worked in Buffalo, Detroit, And then on to Pittsburgh, he worked in Pittsburgh, then, on, then he went on to the Niagara Falls where he worked for the Patton Stone Company, who sent him 
and to work in Philadelphia. While he was there, he received a letter from his father telling him Cyril, his youngest brother, had been killed in action in Belgium on June the 8th, 1917. Now, now we wanted, George wanted to, and to join the army then to, to um, because he lost his brother, he felt he should join the army. But he couldn't join the army where he was because he was in America. And the only way that he could um, and register for the army was to go back to Canada. So he went back up to Canada, to Ottawa, and he registered there and to join the British Army. But um, while he was waiting for his enlistment in the army, the war ended on November the 11th, 1918. But he returned home a sad occasion with Cyril killed and Archie still in France. There's Cyril and there's the man who's killed Archie. He's buried out in France. After four months at home, he decided to return to Canada and sailed from Southampton to New York on the White, La on the White Star Line. Adriatic. In the Adriatic, he got on the steamer there. He sailed over to New York this time. He didn't walk around to Canada, he went to New York. A board ship was a friend, um, Tom Richards, who was in a male voice party. There's another Welsh, Welsh male voice party who was over there. Also a friend. Charlie Rennish, with his wife and two children, are going to Detroit to work for the Ford Company, which made a pleasant journey. And so there were people going over there to work for the Ford Company then. On arrival, he took the train uh, from New York and to Ottawa, 500 miles, and worked again on the Parham buildings until it was completed in 1921. In 1922, I worked at the Parliament Buildings and then completed in 1921. Decided to have a holiday. So he went down to Washington, D.C. In 1922, he decided to visit Washington, D.C. While there, he visited the House of Representatives, known as the Capitol, the American Parliament. He was so impressed by it that he decided some, sometime in the future he would make a model of it. He contacted Mr. David Lynn, the architect for the building, and told him of his idea of carving a model of the capital building. And Mr. Lynn made available blueprints and photographs which assisted him in the work. He then went to work in New Jersey, 10 miles from New York, to work on the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. The rear view, view the quite imposing building, quite a part of it. A bit bigger than ours. The Cathedral of St. John the Divine, the largest New Gothic building in the world. He also went on then to work on another impressive church. Well, this is a carving on the outside of it. He went to work on the Riverside Church with the tallest bell tower. And the largest, the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. Also the Rockefeller Riverside Church. It's interdenominational. Now, now listen to this as a church. Besides an area for worshipping, it has a daycare centre, a creche, a library, a gymnasium, an auditorium. It also has the tallest bell tower in America. 
and the 24th highest bell tower in the world, church bell tower in the world, 392 feet or 22 stories high or 119 meters. In 1924, um, another Welsh choir visited the town when he was working at Newark. He was working in Newark then, which is just outside New York. And he invited them all for dinner to his home, which is quite a size house. So he invited all, all the choir and they had a, another wonderful evening, he said. So, I mean, the size of these churches, they are massive, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They are the institutions, not churches. Mm -hmm. You can see how they draw in the congregation. The epidemic is good In 1929, the Wall Street crash occurred. He wrote, the Wall Street crash came and a terrible depression set in, which lasted for 10 years. 11 billion people out of work, and many losing their life savings. Building work stopped and he was unemployed. So he decided to use his time to make a model of the capital building he had been thinking about all these years. He was also getting older and stroke carving is a very physical trade. So no doubt he was looking towards the future. He started by purchasing French Cane limestone. The limestone is coined in France, near the town of Caen, <coughs> used since the 10th century in France for cathedrals and churches. It is a fine-grained sandstone. William the Conqueror used it to build Westminster Abbey and the Tower of London, because he didn't, uh, um, William the Conqueror, uh, I would only know Welsh quarries, but he landed England, so he got all his stone from France. George ordered eight blocks, which were newly cut, and when newly cut, a limestone is four times as hard as chalk, but hardens with age. He had to devise his own tools to carve are the delicate columns, bases, and fine details needed in his car. There's the Tower of London, still there, still going on. And then he has starts his work on the Capitol building. Uh, it's four times as hard as chalk, but arms with age. He had to devise his own tools to carve the delicate columns, basin, bases, and fine details. Using the blueprints and photographs working on a scale 316 to a foot, he spent three and a half years constructing it, working up to 16 hours a day. The replica is 12 feet long and four foot six inches high. The dome of the capital was carved out of one piece. The model was made in eight sections, to enable it to be transported for exhibitions. When he finished, he displayed it in his home and before exhibiting it around America. That's the finished model. This is an article from the Western Mail about it, but he said he spent a year on the model. He always make a mistake, you know or very often make a mistake, not three and a half years. Mm -hmm. But at least it, uh, it is uh, a, a little harder on what he did. There's a, a close to picture of it. Mm -hmm. See the fine detail. And the dome was carved in one piece with how he did it. Finally, 
the delights of the countless windows. Mm -hmm. The dome is perfect. And that's the finished model. When finished, he displayed it at all. And then he exhibited around America, using the railway to transport the model to various cities and displayed it in large stores. In some, and some of the cities were Port, Portland, Oregon, Seattle. Omaha in Nebraska, and St. Louis, Kansas City, Memphis, and Salt Lake City. And then he just, and in 1939, he exhibited at the World Fair in San Francisco. While there, Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford, the well-known film stars, came to see it. Also Walt Disney who showed an interest in the model, saying maybe it would fit into a new project he had in mind, and to let him know if he decided <coughs> to sell it. In night, from 1940 to 1944, he exhibited all around America. In 1944, the war was still raging, and it was difficult getting real transportation because it was used for troop carrying. <coughs> So, so he put the model in storage and went back to his home. He then later on wrote to his sister saying he had not worked in the trade for 10 years and he was finding it difficult going and apologised for not sending any Christmas uh, presents home at that time. <coughs> and he decided to write to Walt Disney to ask if he was still interested in his model. He was going to use all his savings, and he had to live all, all his savings as well, organising all the trips around the country. So it was a very hard life, I'm sure. He eventually sold it in 19... Oh, 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 this is one of the department stores he showed. He showed it in the 1930s, which is just like the big department stores here. <coughs> but of course, I mean, they didn't have television there. And uh, it would have been a big draw in the 1940s, I should say, very early television. And that's the Paris department store. And it does come up again later on. In 1929, Uncle George, and he's aged quite a bit in 1955, mm -hmm. as we all do. Mm -hmm. Where is it now? In Disneyland. It's now on show in Disney World Orlando, California, and in the Lincoln Memorial Exhibition, which is near the entrance to Disneyland. But there's the entrance to Disneyland, and that's the main walkway in to the Magic Kingdom, the, the princes, the, uh, the palaces were there. As you go, as you walk in on your right hand side, is an exhibition, the exhibition all the way down. The Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. And if you go in that exhibition, you see my uncle's model there. Looks magnificent there, I must say. Well, you all it says is there, um, a Welshman, George Lloyd, made this model. And he, I don't want much information about him at all. My cousin Elvin George went over and he saw it, so he was uh, able to tell me about it. Quite amazing. 
And the guard was quite surprised, uh, the attendant. He said, you're going too near, but he said, my way did. He said, did he? So he was quite amazed. He said, go on, get a bit closer. And I'm going down to take it. Because there's a first thing in the distance from it. So he was quite impressed. I mean, you might have thought that this is the end of the story, but in 2015, my granddaughter was asked to do a project in, uh, in a college of art, or a college of art course. Was asked to do a project on a college of art course. I told her about the great fate Uncle George. It caught her interest, and she started searching the internet. Her inquiry was picked up by a, an American called Mike Wesley was compiling a book about the story behind the exhibits in the Disneyland, Florida. He was very excited to be contacted by a member of the family or the creator of the model of the Capitol building. All the information he had was a leaflet which he, re which he had, had on Amazon in these two leaflets. And the one leaflet came from Salt Lake City when they had, had the exhibition there. These two leaflets. Um, and some local newspaper articles. He got them on the internet for five dollars. He thought it was a wonderful bargain. My granddaughter was able to pass out photographs and information on the life of great great uncle George. His book was going to the publishers, but he had to delay it to add extra material. Eight pages all about George Lloyd, the Welshman who carved the model of the Capitol building. This is the cover of the book. He sent a copy of the book. This is the book. When Uncle George was asked what he hoped would happen to the model after his time, he said, I hope that someday it will find a permanent home in a museum or a public building where many thousands of people will view this model. I believe his wish was granted. And as a footnote, our great Uncle George invested the money he received from Mark Bisbee into an endowment, which meant he would have an income where he lived, enabling him to have financial security. We don't know the sum received for this part. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Probably insured, isn't it, for quite a bit? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, museum, yeah, well, it's uh, worth a fortune, was it? Yeah. It was placed that, didn't it? So, so uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty impressive piece of work. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 We all wonder how much he's paid, <laughs> and the gentleman in America tried to find out, but they, uh, uh, so they wouldn't disclose it. No. Did he pass away in America, Brian? Yes, he was um, a janitor in old town when he died. Really? Yeah, died, so he worked to the end. But uh, when he looked afterwards, he seemed quite um, content with his life. And he had enough income to, to, and to live respectably yeah, yeah. And, and comfortably, you know, in the circumstances there. Yeah. Yeah. He's a confirmed bachelor, was he? Yeah. What's that? Confirmed bachelor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never met him. But, uh, mm -hmm. 
Did any of the aunties ever go over and visit him? Did any of the family no, ever go? No, they couldn't no. afford it. Then. In no. those days, America was no. so far away. <laughs> there was no visiting. No. When you went, you went. No. You didn't come back. You just went back. Yeah. <laughs> no one came back. No. Okay. 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 And we must have made, made good wages to be able to come back yeah. or yeah. to and from. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very skilled man. He must have had to pay wages. Any more questions? You haven't been yeah. to see it yourself, then? <coughs> no, I, I um, no, I missed it. Actually, I went, but um, I didn't have the information, and we must have walked by it. So mm. yeah, he said that's how I've been in there. I didn't really, have the uh, place and all, yeah. and I can just. Oh, my wish, yeah. Him, and there we are, yeah. mm, which is even off to think of them. No, no. no. Yeah. Yeah, we have one of those things in life. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.